All right. So in Revelation chapter 2 and in Revelation chapter 3, what these chapters are about, basically there's, there's seven churches that um, God wanted to send a message to. And they all had their individual messages. And these are all churches that existed during this time of, uh, you know, where John was in Patmos and, you know, he was kind of exiled to this place for, for preaching the gospel. But, um, and actually most of the, interestingly enough, with the topic that we're st studying tonight, most of the scripture is going to be found in the books that, that John the Apostle were, was, had written down. He's the one that wrote them. So we're going to be looking at a lot of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, you know, really just 1 John, I think, and then Revelation here. And I wanted to start off here because what, what the topic is, we're talking about overcoming the world. Okay, overcome. And, and in Revelations 2 and 3, you're going to see this phrase, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh. And it's found many, many places in chapters 2 and chapter 3 in Revelation. And in order to teach this doctrine and, and teach on overcoming the world and what that really means, I'm going to first of all just start off by dismantling some false doctrine that's out there about what this means. So a lot of people that will try to use this and, and twist it into like some kind of works-based salvation. And it's actually really common among people who believe in the dispensational theology framework where they think that you know there's these different ages and different eras of you know where some of them will go as far in hyper dispensationalism to teach that like you know in the old testament they were saved by works now we're in the age of grace and you know for you know from this time to this time there's you know things were this way there people were saved by works by the law because you know show me the person who's ever able to be saved by the law but, you know, they believe this kind of nonsense. They say, well, now we're in the age of grace. And then in the end times, there's going to be another period where people are going to be saved by their works, where there's going to be a faith mixed with works in order for people to be saved. And they turn to places like here in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and they'll mention like in Matthew 24, when it says, he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. They say, see, you got to endure, you got to endure and just, just keep up the good fight and, and, and do all the good works and make it all the way until you die. When in context, and we're not going to go over that, that reference, but you look it up for yourself. Matthew 24 is written to, to, as Jesus' response when the disciples ask him, what, what's it going to be like in the end times? What's going to happen? And he lays it all out for them. And he's referring to their flesh being saved. Because right before that, he says the Antichrist is going to go and, and basically just annihilate the saints. And he's going to go out and you know, there's going to be a lot of martyrs. He's going to make war against the saints and he's going to prevail. And Basically, it says those that endure to the end shall be saved because he's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. Yeah, they're going to be saved from facing that physical death because Satan's going to be on a rampage trying to kill all the Christians. They'll be saved from the physical death when Jesus Christ comes back because that's when they're going to be raptured and they're going to be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's going to be great. But that's all that's talking about. When you read the book in context, it's, it's evident that it's not talking about our, our souls being saved or anything like that. And, and they'll say, oh, well, this happens at the end time, so it must be a different means of salvation, which is completely ridiculous. But we're going to look at some of these verses in Revelation 2 and 3, and it's important, again, to keep the context in mind. When people want to want to come at you with this bizarre doctrines, they don't keep it in context. They just go and they want to point out this scripture, this scripture, you know, this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, and try to try to fit it all together. But it doesn't work when you actually see, well, what is this even talking about? And in Revelation 2 and 3, these are messages to individual churches that existed at that time. Now, it doesn't mean we can't learn from this. It doesn't mean we can't apply this to other churches. It doesn't, you know, there's a lot of problems that are laid out here and saying, look, you know, you guys need to repent. You need to fix this. You need to change that. This is good, but you, need, you got this other problem over here. And he's kind of threatening them all. Look, if you, if you don't get this stuff right, I'm going to remove your candlestick. I'm going to, I'm going to remove your place. And, and you won't be a, a legitimate church in my eyes anymore. And that's what he's saying under these churches. And there, you know, there's plenty for us to learn today and to look at. But um, let's look at some of these times that it's referencing to him that overcometh. So like in, in verse number 7 here in Revelation chapter 2, by words, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
Verse number 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So these are, I mean, and this is obviously saying, okay, when you overcome, hey, you're going to eat of the tree of life, right? That's talking about salvation. When you overcome, you're not going to be hurt of the second death, right? Again, another thing referencing salvation. Look at verse number 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now flip over to chapter 3, and verse number 12. Bible reads, he, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. And, and, you know, you can look at these and say, well, yeah, this is talking about salvation. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? It's talking about being saved. But the problem comes in is, well, what does it mean to overcome? Who is it that overcomes? Well, we find that answer a little bit earlier. And see, if you only reference Revelation, you can look at this stuff, and God's talking about them repenting and, and doing works and doing good works. And you can say, see, well, he's talking about them, you know, doing this right and getting, you know, this right in their church, and they're doing all these works, and then it just says to him that overcometh, you know, they're going to be in heaven. And, and if that's all you ever looked at, if this is what your focus was on, I can see where you would just think. Well, maybe works are involved for salvation. And they say, because it's in Revelation, well, this is just, maybe in the future it's based on works. and Because they, they don't understand how comprehend it's like, you know, not everything in Revelation is talking about future events. In fact, the first three chapters aren't necessarily talking about future events. You know, not, not at all. I mean, it's, you can make applications and there's some truth and wisdom in there, but it's not foretelling things that are going to happen. This is things that were happening at that time. But we find the answer to this not even a problem in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, we get a very, very clear statement on what it means to overcome and who it is that overcomes. Look at 1 John chapter 5, just a couple pages back in your Bible from Revelation. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 4. The Bible reads, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. So who is it that overcomes? Believers. Right. Who is he that overcomes? Who is it that, that's going to eat of the tree of life? He that overcometh. Who is it that's not going to be heard of the second death? He that overcometh. Who is it that's going to be getting a new name and a, and a white stone with a new name written there? He that overcometh. And who is it that overcometh? He that believes on Jesus Christ. So you see, it's not talking about works at all. And, and, and it's, the same, it, it's interesting, and, and it, it ought to be noted, it's coming from the same author, if you will. Now, obviously, God's the author of the whole Bible, but, but coming from the same person, he's not, you know, he's, it's not like John's thinking, oh, you've got to do works here to be saved, because he already said in, in the first epistle of, you know, of John that whosoever believes on Jesus is, is the one that overcomes the world. It's our faith that overcometh the world. And keeping that in mind, then, you can also see, flip back to Revelation chapter uh, 2. Look at verse number 26. I didn't cover this when we were going through the list because there's, a little, there's something a little bit different here. Look at verse 26. It says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. So now we see something a little bit different. And, you know, the other ones, we're all talking about things that you receive that would pertain to salvation. The tree of life, the, the, the second, you know, not going to the second death, not going to, to the lake of fire. You know, receiving that new name, well, here it's saying you're going to give power over the nations. But it's not just for those that are saved. It's for those that are saved and keep my works unto the end. See, God gives rewards. God's going to give extra, you know, bonuses, if you will. He's going he's to pay out for the work that you've done in this world. And he says that you need to, you do need to do the works unto the end. You need to not faint. You know, you're running this race. You can't just, just fall and, and, and not get back up and just end your life by, you know, it, by, by not keeping those works. You know, if you do not keep the works, you're still going to be saved, you're still going to heaven, but you're not going to necessarily be having power given to you over the nations. 
that's going to be given to the people that keep the works unto the end. And that's why you see you have to overcome. You have to be saved because otherwise you're not going to be ruling over anything anyways. And you have to keep the works unto the end. That's the only place here where we see works being involved. And then you don't have to turn there, but in Revelation 21.7 it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, I should have mentioned that before, but again, it's just, if you overcome, you're going to inherit all things. God's your God, and, and you're going to be his son. Just like we were talking about this morning, about being born again. It's anybody that's saved. Now, I, I kind of wanted to dispel that and just show you that it's not talking about your works at all. The one place it is talking about works it's talking about getting rewards. It's not your salvation. It's you're overcoming and doing the works. They're separate from each other. Doing the works is separate from overcoming. Otherwise, it would be redundant to say, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Doesn't make any sense. They have to be completely separate because he that overcometh the world is he that believes on Jesus Christ. Now, um, like I said, I wanted to just throw that out there since we're covering this topic. But more importantly, flip back if you would to 1 John. We're going to reread 1 John 5, 4 again. Because what I really want this sermon to be about is, is to help you understand that, you know, this overcoming the world in, in more than just the sense of salvation. We can see, we can see clearly. I mean, you don't need me to explain 1 John 5, 4 and 5 to you that it's talking about people who believe on Christ overcome the world. But... Um, so let's just reread it real quick. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, we do have to overcome the world in our life. And not just in regards to salvation. So most of the sermons tonight, it's not going to be talking about salvation. You know, this is the, the primary application of this. is talking about being saved. It's talking about your faith in Jesus Christ. But there's also the application of, you know, we are in a constant battle, in a constant struggle every day against our flesh and against this world. There are forces that are always withstanding us. There's evil forces that come from the world that we are fighting against. And we need to be able to overcome that just as much as our faith in Jesus Christ helps us overcome the world by being saved and just granting access into heaven and, and being with God. Just as much as we need that faith to be saved, we also need that faith to overcome the world in our day-to-day -day life. Overcome the battles that you face. We need to have that faith. And we're going to look into that a little bit here. Um, keep a finger, a bookmark in 1 John because we're coming right back to it. And flip, if you would, to John chapter 16. And you start thinking about that, like, man, overcoming the world? That sounds like a daunting task. That sounds pretty, you know, like the whole world? What, just me, little old me, overcome the whole world? Most of us are just trying to get by one day at a time. Like, I'm just trying to survive here. What do you mean, overcome the world? Well, we can overcome the world. The world's a big place. The world's got a lot of power. The world's got a lot of influence. The world can make you feel small and insignificant. Look at John 16, verse number 32. John 16, 32. Jesus Christ said, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The world is going to bring you tribu tribulation. That's what Jesus was saying to his disciples. That's what Jesus says to anyone. The Bible says, Yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Everybody, it's going to do what's right. From, from his time on, when you decide to live for God, when you decide to live in accordance with what the Scripture says, you will be attacked for that. The world's going to come after you. It will happen. But what Jesus is saying here, look, in the world, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have tribulation. The world is going to be against you. Look at how much the world was against him. They nailed Jesus to the cross. They conspired. They lied about them. They got him arrested. They murdered him. He said, they did it to me. You know they're going to do that to you. He was perfect. I mean, he did everything right. We're, not, we're imperfect. You know, we, we might end up you know, making mistakes and, and, and have our own uh, messes to clean up and, and, and have things come across us. We, you could say, well, yeah, but I've, I've screwed up here and you know, I've, yeah, I'm kind of reaping what I sow. Jesus didn't reap what he sowed. Not in that sense, at least. I mean, he, he, wasn't, he didn't do anything wrong. 
but he was still murdered. He was still persecuted. He still had tribulation that he faced. And what he's telling us, he says, look, in the world, you're going to have the tribulation, but you know what? Don't let that get you down. Don't, don't let that discourage you. Be of good cheer. Be happy, actually. Why? Because he says, I have overcome the world. He says, the world has got nothing on me. That's Jesus' attitude. I've overcome the world. And through Christ, we could overcome the world too. We're, 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 we're small. We are insignificant compared to the, comparison to the world. We're no match for the world, but through Christ, yeah, I could do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. All things. Christ already did it. We get to overcome through him. Flip back, if you would, to 1 John. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. The Bible says in verse number 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He's warning about the false prophets. He's warning about these people who are going to be preaching all kinds of lies and preaching out of their own heart and preaching for filthy lucre's sake. And he's saying, you need to try these spirits. You need to test them. You need to see what are they really preaching. Does it line up with God's word? He says, every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, hey, that's not of God. He says, but you know what? You have overcome them. You've overcome the false prophets because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. He's the world hears them. The false prophets of the day, you know how you can identify a false prophet? When the world loves them. When, 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 when a preacher can be put on all the TV stations and just publicized to the world and everybody loves it. When, when, the, when the prophet, you know, the, the so-called prophet could come to town and... Hey, everybody's gathering around. We're all coming to them. And no one's saying a bad word about the guy. False prophet. Why? Because he's appealing to the world. The world hears their own. The world says, oh, yeah, you're just like me. Well, they're not of the Father if they're of the world. He says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. The people of the world of Jesus' day, they weren't able to hear him. He was speaking to them, but they weren't able to hear him. And they killed him. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, in one sense, the primary application of these verses, we've already overcome the world because we're saved. And because Jesus has overcome the world, we get to share that victory with him. We only get to overcome through him because of our faith. But um, turn if you would to 1 John chapter 2. We still need to be prepared for and avoid the things of the world and call them out that, that would overcome us without Christ. The, thing, you know, the, the reason, you know, without Christ, the world will overcome you. Well, how is it going to overcome you? It's going to look at some of, those, some of those reasons. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse number 12. The Bible reads, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. The wicked one. Who's that? Satan. The devil. The wicked one is out there, and... When you get saved, you've overcome him also because, you know, the, the Satan is the God of this world. The wicked one is in charge of, you know, basically is the one setting the, the standard and setting the pace for the worldliness, for everything that's out there in the world. Satan's behind those things. The Bible says, look at verse number 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
Now, when it says, love not the world, it's not talking about the people in the world. It's not just saying, like, like and, and, and there's still a sense of truth that you, know, you, have to, you don't just love everybody who ever exists, ever. I mean, there's, there's people that the Bible even teaches that, you know, you don't just love everybody. But when it's talking about loving the world, it's talking about the things, you know, it says, neither the things that are in the world. What the world is putting out. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not him. And that's a pretty strong statement, too. If you love the world, the Bible says you don't love God. The love of God is not in you when you love this world, when you just love everything that the world is about. And he goes in a little bit more detail. Look at verse 16. For all that is in the world. And he just explains exactly what he's talking about here. Because the world is pretty broad, right? Well, what are you talking about? What is the world? All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... And the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, I'm going to break down the, these three categories of what is in the world. Because this is what we need to be on guard for. This is what we need to look out for. This is what we want to make sure that we don't love. Because if we love the things of the world, we don't love God. I mean, that's what the Bible's saying. We need to make sure we have the proper attitude in regards to the lust of the flesh. We need to have the proper attitude regarding the lust of the eyes. And we need to have the proper attitude regarding the pride of life. Let's look at some of the, uh, the turn if you will to Galatians chapter 5. But, but some common lusts of the flesh. Drinking, for example, that's a lust of the flesh. Because what's a lust of the flesh? It's what your flesh desires. It's what your body craves. It's what you want. That is a lust of your flesh. And when it's in regards, in context here, in regard to the Bible, it's talking about the lust of the flesh. It's not a positive reference. It's not like eating the food that you need to survive when your belly is saying, I, I need to, some food to sustain me. That's not what it's talking about when it's in regards to the lusts of the flesh. It's things that you lust after. It's things that maybe make you feel good but are sinful. Things that are not good for you to do, like getting drunk, going out and having that booze and just, just drinking it up. That's a lust of the flesh. If you love getting drunk, if you love drunkenness, the love of the Father is not in you. You love the things of the world. And what does the world do? The world's advertising all the booze to you. The world's trying to show you on the TV screen and everywhere else that drinking's just fine, nothing wrong with it. Everybody's doing it. It's a good time. Have fun. No problems. No worries. Doesn't going to cause anything bad. Gluttony. You know, I said, I said earlier that, that eating isn't, uh, you know, it's not, it's not what I was talking about. When, but when you're given over to just food and just eating, 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 and not caring about what's put in your body and, and just, and just overindulging and just, just really going after this food, that's sinful. And that's another lust of the flesh. Now, people can suffer with these things. And I get it. And everybody has different sins and everyone's got different problems. But you ought not to love those things. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're stuck in a bondage of sin, you need to get out. You need help getting out. And I get that. You, but you need to have the right mindset of, of saying, you know, I don't want to do this. I, I want to get rid of this and, and, and get through it. But when you have the love of the world and you love the lust of the flesh and you're just indulging in it and you just say, yeah, man, I love this. Because a lot of people do. You know what? I was doing that for a while with the drinking thing. I mean, I love doing it. And I wanted to keep doing it. And I was foolish. And you know what? The love of God wasn't in me. I didn't love God when I was going out and just indulging in my flesh. Not at all. I might have said I did. If you were to ask me, I'd say, well, yeah, I love God. Well, your actions don't prove it. And the Bible says that you don't love God. And those are harsh words. But we, but, you know, we need to keep the harsh words fresh in our mind and just realize, don't fool yourself. You know, I need to not fool myself back then thinking that I love God. No, I don't. And you can only fool yourself for so long. And even at that point in my life, I remember starting to think to myself, you know, I started to question my salvation. I said, do I even, you know, how can I keep doing all these things that I know are wrong? I say I believe the Bible, but I, I was asking myself, you know, I wasn't even talking to anyone else, just myself. How can I say that I believe this book? when I'm just blatantly not doing the things that I, that I claim I believe. Even through that time, you know, I knew I was saved, but, but it, got, it got really bad where I was just thinking, like, how can I do this stuff? And one thing that is for sure, though, I didn't love God. 
Didn't love them. I love the things of the world. Fornication or adultery. That's another lust of the flesh, right? We're talking about the lust of the flesh here. Don't love these things. Don't love the world. The lust of the flesh. You're in Galatians chapter 5. We're actually going to see a whole, nother, a whole list here of things that the Bible says are lust of the flesh. And it's, you know, I, I pulled out a few of them. We went over that. But look at verse number 19 in Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, another strong statement there. All of these things. Look, if any of these are part of your life that you actually are just giving yourself over to any of these things and you're just, in, just, just enjoying it and going on in it, the love of God is not in you. That's the lust of the flesh. Let's look at the lust of the eyes. What falls into the category of the lust of the eyes? Because the lust of the flesh, you know, again, it's a fleshly appeal. That drunkenness, that, that fornication really satisfies or gratifies your flesh. Completely wicked and sinful, but that's what that does. You have a special, a certain lust of the eyes, which it's still sort of a lust of the flesh, but it's specific to the eyes. What are some of the things of the eyes that, that would be a lust of the eyes? Covetousness. When you look on things that other people have and desire them and wish that they were yours. When you look at your neighbor's wife. When you look at your neighbor, you know, the, paraphrasing from the 10th from the commandment, right? You go back to Exodus chapter 20, look at the 10th commandment that says, you know, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's ox, his neighbor's ass, his neighbor's manservant, his maidservant, or anything that's your neighbor's. You know, when you're looking on something someone else has and you want that, that's covetousness. Our society teaches us to covet things and tells you, hey, you need this and you want this and you ought, you know, doing everything to make you think that you need these things and want these things. That's a, that's a wicked sin. That's a big sin, covetousness. It's one of the Ten Commandments. That's a lust of the eyes. And you know what? If you have a problem and you're just giving over, you say, I just, I just love going out and just looking at all these things that I know I can't have. You need to get right with God. You need to not love the things. That, that's what this world does. That's what this world's trying to put out there. That's what the world thinks. There's no problem with it. Just like the world these days is starting to think there's no problem with adultery. No problem. They definitely think there's no problem with fornication. They think, oh yeah, that's what kids do. They just go out and do that before they settle down and get married. That's, I mean, that's what the world puts out there. That's what the world thinks is fine. Drinking, no problem. Go ahead, get drunk, have fun, let up some steam. They only think it's a problem when it gets like really, really, really bad to where you're beating up your family and, you know, losing your job over it. Then they'll say it's a problem. But up to that point, no big deal. When you're, when you're, when you're, um, I shall behold hold strange women and your heart shall utter perverse things because you're drinking. The world doesn't have a problem with that. Lust of the eyes, covetousness. What about idolatry? Right? Putting up something before God and, and looking to something else besides looking to God. A, obvious one, pornography, adulterous lusting after people, putting these images in front of your eyes, you're feasting your eyes on, on, on uh, you know, the nakedness and, and, on, and on things that you ought not to be looking at. That's a lust of the eyes. Again, the world's going to tell you that's fine. And you, you, you see these statistics and they're mind-boggling. How many people are, are into the, the pornography and stuff that's on, you know, all this stuff. It's like, God help us. But that's the lust of the eyes. And you're giving yourself over to this stuff. You don't love God. When you're just sitting there and just enjoying all this. Or even the, uh, the movies and the television these days that are promoting all the lewdness and the sin. I mean, it's, 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 they're pumping in front of your eyes all the time. You say, yeah, but I really like this show. Yeah, but it's really, you know, it's really cool. It's really interesting or whatever. But they're just putting all this garbage in front of you. Don't give in to the lust of the eyes. It's of the world. It's not of the Father. It's not of God. And then the last thing, the pride of life. Pride of life, that's, a, that's another one of the major things that is of the world. People are real proud, proud of their own accomplishments, proud and lifted up and think really highly of themselves, tend to be people that also are respecter of persons. 
and their judgment, right? They care more about someone who's successful and all this other stuff, and, and, and they won't be able to properly judge. They're proud themselves, and they only give respect to certain people. They're respecter of persons. They're not humble. You know, the Bible teaches us to esteem others better than ourselves. Proud people aren't humble. That's the exact opposite, obviously. You know, you're either proud or you're humble. You know, this is, you, you, you know, somewhere on the scale in between, but they're exact polar opposites of each other. And the Bible teaches us over and over and over again, even Jesus Christ himself, who had every right to be proud if he wanted to. I mean, he, he's God, God incarnate, you know, the King of kings and Lord of lords on this earth. Yet he came as a servant. And he came and, and washed his disciples' feet. I mean, he did the most humbling things and ministered unto others instead of being ministered to. As the example that we ought to have, hey, the pride of life, when you become a proud individual, that's exact antichrist. It's the exact opposite of what Christ was trying to teach us. People of the pride of life end up laying up treasures on earth. And that's where their heart is, is because they, they tend to be, you know, have be well accomplished. And there's nothing wrong with being well accomplished, but people who are, are proud typically are this way because they've built everything and they feel like they've done it all themselves and they've earned everything themselves without giving credit unto God at all. Not glorifying Him and giving Him credit. The Bible says that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights. That, that He gives us the things that we have. He's given us the abilities that you have. He's given you the opportunities you have. He's allowed these good things to happen. We need to give a, a proper respect and regard unto the Lord. All of these things are what the world has to offer. This is what the world is promoting. We need to overcome these things. That's how we overcome the world. We're overcoming the wicked one who's pushing these things on us. And all of these things will try to get you into bondage. Don't love that bondage. Don't love what the world's putting out. If you do, the love of the Father is not in you. And basically, if you want to know, is this of the world? Just ask yourself, is this from God? Because basically anything that's not of God, that's not from God, that's not godly, that God's not putting forth, it's of the world. There's a big one I didn't even mention, but you know, I'm always trying to warn my children about this. It's the, uh, the worldly music. And I would classify that in the lust of the flesh. Now, not everybody is affected the same way with music. Like my wife has never been really influenced or impacted that much by music at all. She's kind of told me before, that, yeah, she had music that she listened to, but like it wasn't a big deal for her. For me, music was my life. I mean, it was such a part of my life, and it still is. Now, don't get me wrong, I love music. I still love music. But the worldly music was like, when I finally got rid of that, out of, you know, I kind of just decided, you know what, I need to get rid of this because I know it's not good. I felt that. That was, a, that was a big sacrifice for me personally. Why? Because music is extremely powerful. Music is something that you can feel. I, mean, I, I had song. I mean, you could feel it inside. You could feel it in your soul when the music's playing and, and it's something that gives you a feeling. That's a lust of the flesh. And you got to be careful about that and not just write it off as saying it's harmless. Music is extremely powerful. And Satan knows that very well. That's why you could look at all the lyrics and all the messages that are being pumped into your mind through music. Why? Because you could hear a song. Hey, man, that song feels good. Hey, I like the way that sounds. And get you listening to something that if it was just someone speaking those words, you'd be like, get that away from me. I don't want to hear that garbage at all. But when they put it to the sound, they put it to the music, they put it to a good beat, they got the drums going, man, they got the guitar going. All of a sudden, it's music to your ears. I love this. Hey, this feels good. And you start to get this attachment to his motion attachment. The whole time, pff, messaging's going right into your brain. I, I, would, I like stuff that, I, I like all genres of music. And I would listen to this stuff. I used to listen to stuff, this garbage, like Nine Inch Nails and Metallica. And look, there, Nine Inch Nails has songs that's called Heresy. The name of the song is called Heresy. Say, your God is dead. And no one cares. He says, if there's a hell, I'll see you there. Those are the lyrics to this song. And as a Christian, as a believer, I was listening to this junk. Why? Because I like the music. It rubbed me the wrong way. I hated hearing that. But at the same time, I wouldn't turn it off. I like the music. Music had a lot of power. 
A lot of power. It does. Music is very influential. There's good music. I mean, the, the book of Psalms, the biggest book in the whole Bible is a book of music. Psalms are songs. They're spiritual songs. They're, they're songs that God made. Music's great. Nothing wrong with music if it's of God. Book of Psalms, music from God. But the music that this world puts out, it's not of God. It's of the world. We shouldn't love that which is of the world. I'm going to have to do a whole sermon. I haven't done a sermon on music in a long time. I think I'm going to have to do another one on that. And again, it's kind of like alcohol. I mean, those are, there's a few things that, that were really big in my life. And I really want to warn people about it. Because I even noticed as with the music thing, as I started to get right with God and just kind of getting different sins out of my life and just doing what's right and really getting on track, when I would start just giving in and just listening to all this worldly music and kind of indulging in that, in that aspect, I would end up doing, committing other sins. I would end up slipping and falling in many other areas of my life. I was more prone to go out and have a drink when I was listening to music. I, you know, you listen to things that would just kind of put you in a certain spirit. You know, and, and, and if you like rock and roll, like I did, again, another thing, classic rock, all this rock and roll. You know what that teaches? Rebellion. That's what it's all about. The world will even tell you that. Look at the rebellious 60s and the 70s and the long hair and everything. Everything that is anti-Christ is put into that music. I was too stupid to even realize it or think about it at the time, but it's like, I mean, wh what is it with all the, why do all the rock stars have this long hair? Why? It's a shame. Because it's completely, it, it, it teaches a rebellion. When you look at the, at the scripture, you look at 1 Corinthians 11, you're dishonoring your head, which is Christ. The Bible talks about the hair specifically. Oh, why do you care about the length of your hair? It, it, it refers to honoring or dishonoring your head and it, it, it gives the uh, analogy of, of your physical hair with with your respect for God and your you know because the 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 the, the head of the the woman is the man the Bible says and the head of the man is Christ and when the woman has long hair the Bible says that's a glory to her and it honors her head it honors the man when the woman has long hair and when the man has short hair that that glories and honors his head which is Christ but when you do the opposite, when the woman has a short hair and the man has a long hair, that's a dishonor unto both. So it's a dishonor unto Christ. It's a spirit of rebellion saying, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do exactly the opposite. There is definitely a spirit involved. And it's like when you go to the concerts, it's like a worship service. Literally, I mean, you got the guys up on stage, you got all the lights and stuff, and everybody putting their hand, you know, just, just putting their hand, you know, think about, think about how many churches you go to where people are singing spiritual songs, their hands up in the air, you go to a rock concert, what are they doing? They're putting up the devil signs and, and, and you know, in, in, engaging in the worship service of your idol that's up on the stage that you have the poster of at home. You bought all their stuff. You listen and read everything they put out. I was so into this stuff. I had books like these autobiographies and biographies of, of all these different, you know, the Jim Morrison of the Doors and all the members of Metallica and all this. Like, I, I, not only did I listen to music, I read it. I had the, what was the name of that magazine? That stupid heavy metal magazine, Parade Magazine or something, or Circus Magazine, Circus Magazine, back in the 80s. Like, I mean, I was into this stuff, okay? And I'm not, I'm not trying to glory over it at all. It's wicked, but it's just, it, 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 it has a really, really powerful influence. Watch out for the stuff that the world puts out. If it's not of God, it's of the world. And we shouldn't love the things of the world. And you know, those are all the examples I have, but you could go on and on. I mean, just, just analyze the things that, that, you, that you do, you participate in. Is it of the, is it of the Father or is it of the world? You know, is, is, it, is it something that's promoting sin and wickedness or is it something that's, that's glorifying to God? The temptation is to love the things of the world and this is how the devil wants to overcome you. So how do we fight it? What's the answer? It's our faith. We already saw that. Ephesians chapter 6. I'll turn if you want to Hebrews 11. Ephesians 6 gives us the, the, the various uh, pieces of the armor of God, right? We need to have the, the, the helmet of salvation and, and the, the sword, which is the word of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 16, above all, so above all the pieces of the armor that you could possibly take, it says, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. 
when the wicked one is trying to overcome you and he's throwing all these things at you and he's trying to tempt you with this sin and that sin and he's trying to throw this aspect of the world at you and trying to get you to love the things of the world. We need that shield of faith to stop him. And why is it faith? Well, oftentimes we need to just, if you, if you haven't gone through these things through experience, you need to have the faith to, have, to, to, to understand that the Bible is providing you some wisdom here. You don't need to experience everything to know that it's wrong. You don't need to experience getting drunk and being a drunk to know that it's wrong. You don't have to experience listening to all the world music to know that's wrong. You don't have to experience all these things if you just could have the faith to trust in God's word to say, God knows more than me. He's looking out for me as I was bringing up this morning in the sermon. Our Father cares about us. I'm just going to have the faith in what God says to know that I shouldn't be involved with this stuff. And, and that's going to be my shield. That's going to protect me is my faith in God's Word. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the faith chapter. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This faith, you know, Faith is things that you, you can't see it. You don't know. It's not right in front of you. I don't need to have faith to know that I've got a glass of water sitting here on the pulpit. It's, I can see it. It's right there. Obvious it is. It's a fact. You need faith for the things that you don't see. It's things that are off in the future. It's things that you're hoping for. It's things that you, that you, um, know, you, know, you know, but you can't actually see it. And this entire chapter is full of examples of people overcoming the world through their faith. It's, go, it's, it's a great record. You know, it's talking about Abraham, it talks about Moses, it talks about Noah, it's about all these people that, that did these great things through faith. And, uh, you know, go home and read that tonight. It's an awesome chapter. People did all kinds of things. Great recap of all these great men in the Bible and, and all the faith that they had. But jump down to verse number 32 there near the end. Verse number 32, after he goes through this whole list of Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Noah. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. He said, I don't even have time to go through all these people that lived you know, a faithful lives. It says in verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms. I mean, that's a great work, subduing a kingdom, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Talk about the world being against you. You got entire armies coming against you. You got lions coming against you. You got all these things on the attack against you. But through faith, they overcame all of those things. Every single one was conquered through faith. Faith in God got them through and delivered them out of all their troubles, all their tribulations, all their persecutions. Verse number 35, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Then it goes on and continues on with the people who ended up suffering for the cause of Christ, who ended up going through, um, you know, faithfully, held to the word, held, you know, but, but were... Um, were persecuted and ended up uh, being martyred for those things. Now, the last place we're going to turn is Numbers chapter 13. I just want to show you one example here. One biblical example besides all the examples in Hebrews 11. We're going to focus on one here, an example of faith, of the faith that's required to overcome the world. And I think this kind of spells it out real, real well, Numbers 13. In Numbers 13, it's the story of uh, when Moses had sent out the spies to spy out the land, right? They, they went out to spy out the promised land before they had entered in. They're in the wilderness. God had, had delivered them out of Egypt. And he says, okay, I want you to go in and check out the land. See what we're facing. What, what, you know, we're going to make a plan. What are we going to do here? And he sent out the, the 12 Numbers 13, look at verse number 26. Make sure I'm there myself. Verse number 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us. 
And surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit thereof. They're saying, yeah, this is a great land. Check it out. Look at the fruit that we brought back. Look at how great this place is, just like God said. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Look at verse 28. Nevertheless, but the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are, well, we are well able to overcome it. That's the attitude that Caleb had. He's saying, you know what, these other, these other people, they're bringing up this bad report. They're saying, yeah, hey, the land's great, but you know what? They've got the giants there. They've got these great, big, walled cities. They've got their defenses. They've got all these people, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. He says, all these people are there. We can't, we can't beat them. We can't do this. And Caleb says, let's go. Let's get it. Let's go possess it right now. God's promised it to us. We're able to overcome it. We're well able to overcome it. Not just barely. We're not going to squeak out a victory. We are well able to overcome it. Verse 31, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we, there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so were we, so we were in their sight. And they're just discouraging all the people. They're letting the wind. And think about, I mean, this is very representative of how overwhelming the world can be against you. All the challenges, all the fights. Well, they've got walled cities. I mean, they've got great defenses. Not only that, they've got these giants. I mean, these people, how are we going to fight these giants? They're huge. They're strong. We're no match for them. They, they've got great defenses. We can't do this. And that's what the world's going to want to make you think in your life. There's no way you can overcome this. Maybe you're caught up in a sin like, like drunkenness. Hey, yeah, there's, don't, even, don't even bother trying to get out of it. And that's the way the world's going to try to beat you down. The Satan's going to attack you when you, try to, when you try to get rid of sin sometimes and then you slip and you fall again and you get back into it. He's going to try to discourage you to the point to where you just want to give up and throw up your hands and say, I can't do this. Don't fall into that trap. You need to have the faith that you can overcome that. You can why can you overcome it? Through Christ. Through the strength that God has for you. You can overcome it. He says, we're well, Caleb said, we're well able to overcome. You need to keep that attitude. You need to keep that faith in the Lord. Because, again, as I mentioned this morning, you know, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He's able to strengthen us. He's able to, to give us the power that we need to overcome. But we need to have faith. We need to have faith in God. We need to have faith in God's word. When Jesus says things like, you know, or, or when the Bible says I can do all things through Christ, that, that means all things. When Jesus says you have, if you have faith in the grain of a seed of mustard, you know, you could, you could say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and, and, and it'll do it. I mean, you, when, you could, when you can have that much faith, he says that little faith is enough to move mountains. That's all that's required. We just need to believe it. We need to, to have that on our side. You know, thank God that we, we've overcome the world already through our salvation in Jesus Christ, through our faith in Him as our Savior. But let's not let the world overcome us in this life for the works that we're doing so that we can do our works unto the end and receive that great blessing of being able then to rule and reign with Jesus in the millennium and, and keep those works unto the end with our faith that we've overcome uh, uh, the world. And uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your great words and the instruction that we have here, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us all to overcome the sins in our life and, and help us to have the right attitude on, on the, um, the lusts of our flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life, dear Lord, that we wouldn't find ourselves loving these things and loving the things of the world because that means that we don't love you and that the love of the Father is not in us. Dear God, help these words to sink down and, and really that we would take them seriously, dear Lord, and not just read over it, not just uh, not care about it, but, but actually uh, let it sink into our hearts. And when we're dealing with things, dear Lord, especially, I mean, this really gets into the area of just willfully 
sinning and, and loving the, the things of the world that we shouldn't be loving, dear Lord. Help us to have the right attitude and to, to clean up our lives that we could be better used of you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.